So hey there fellow YouTubers, it's Frank Bush here again. So this is the location I think I'm going to set up my uh, camp in. I've been here before, you might have seen this in previous videos if you've watched lots of my previous videos in the past. I like the kind of flat zone that's in this area. It allows me to do a lot of on the ground stuff if you will. So I'll get the bag strapped up and uh, we'll get this video going. <sighs> okay, so I brought along the walking poles with me today. Just set them to the side for a second. I'll be using those in the shelter. Like I said, just got to throw the bag up. So, as lots of people have seen if you've watched previous videos, I've got a six to eight foot length of rope that's got just a loop in the one end. I'm going to take that, wrap it around the tree. I'm going to take the tag end of the line. And I'm just going to feed that through the loop to cinch it onto the tree. Now we the cordage is on there, good and solid. I'll just find myself a stick. I'm going to want to do a Merlin spike hitch here, where I take the line, put a loop into it, fold it onto itself, reach in and grab the main line that's connected to the trunk of the tree. I feed a stick through and just cinch that tight. That locks that stick onto the cordage as such and gives me a toggle point that I can now hang the little handhold on my bag through. So I take my bag, it's got like I say a little handle on the top, I just press that up against the tree, feed the stick through, make sure that I'm sitting on the cordage and not on the stick, and my bag is now hung on that tree. Just helps get off the dirt, stops the moisture of the earth getting up and into the bag. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is uh, just clear out some of the little backbreaker debris that's sitting in this area. I've been in this location, like I say, I've been in this location previously. I've camped in this exact spot, so the debris isn't too bad in here. But uh, anything that looks like it might bother me when I'm sleeping, I'll just get rid of, right? I'm going to go off into the bush and just grab uh, three, stri uh, three straight sticks throw together my tripod so I can get the camera up right now it's just sitting on top of the bag but uh, I want to have some flexibility where I position the camera and that kind of stuff so like I say I'll just make sure I get all the little nubs and uh, set up my camera and then I'll cut back so I got the uh, camera up on the tripod I just used the fast lashing to get the tripod together uh, if you don't know about that stuff I showed that in lots of previous videos uh, potentially depending on how I set up my cook kit later you'll see it again so I just didn't bother putting it on the film for this but uh, I'm just going to pop off my tarp bag and start to get ready to get my shelter together here. I don't know if the camera is picking up the noise, but the wind's definitely getting a little breezy. So I'll have to keep an eye on that. But uh, either way, like I say, i got my uh, shelter i got to get set up. And there's, there's a lot I want to show in this video. So I'll just cut scenes here and get on to it. So as you can see, it's definitely getting a little breezy. You know, quite often I camp out in very uh, thick forest. I'm on the west coast of North America and uh, it's a rainforest. So you don't get these big open patches where you're going to have clear, you know, spots to set up in. You know, quite often you're in dense forest. You know, the one thing I do kind of look out for, I don't know if the camera's picking this up, but there's, let's see, right up in this area, there's a widow maker, but that widow maker is on the other side of a couple trees. So if it does come down, I know that it's not going to come down on top of my camp. You know, because I've camped here previously, I've already kind of scoped the solidity of the trees around me. And most of them are really stable, solid. That's the one tree that is questionable. And like I say, I know that if it does come down, it would have to go through multiple trees to get to me. So I'm, I'm not overly worried about it. But, you know, generally speaking, you want to set up in these open areas kind of away from any type of widow makers. You know, trees that if they do come down, they're going to take you out and your family's going to be looking for a new dad, right? <laughs> but, uh... Needless to say, when you're out in these types of environments, you don't really have that luxury. So you just have to kind of be very mindful of watching out for anything that potentially is going to come down in windy weather on top of you. 
So in this video I'm going to be using my 10 foot by 10 foot or I think it's 3 meter by 3 meter square tarp again. This is an AquaQuest tarp that I'm using. For the people that are curious about what brand of tarp and that type of stuff. It weighs about a pound and a half so it's nice and lightweight in that regard. I just want to lay it all out flat. So I'll pretty it up and then I'll cut back. So as you can see I've laid out the tarp flat now. So the thinking really is back in this corner I'm going to peg that down and there's the tie out point that's out on the corner here. I'm going to come in one tie out and one tie out from that corner along both these lines. I'm going to pull those together and peg them down and I'm going to do the same on this side. I'm going to pull those together peg that down and then this one is going to get pegged to the earth as well. So I'll show that in detail. So like I say, I'm just going to start on one of the corners now. So just pull out one of my tent bags. Just want to peg that into the earth. Really simple. Now I'll shift to the side that's opposite this, or sorry, parallel to this. I don't know what the word is for that. I'll come along this line and go out to that side first off. Okay, so like I say, this is the side I just pegged out. I'm going to come off to this now. Grab another tent peg. Like I say, rather than going off the corner, I've got a tie out here, and there's one in the center, another, and in the corner. I'm going to come in one, and I'm going to do that here as well, where I'm just coming out one from the corner. I'm going to take those two tie outs, I'm going to bring those together. I'm going to throw the tent peg through the both of them. Make sure I'm fairly taut on this line. And peg those down. I'm going to do the same now on that opposite corner. I'm going to pull the two tie-outs that are in one from the corner together and peg that down. First off, I'm going to put on my knee pads though, because I know I'm just going to get filthy if I don't. <laughs> well, one of the straps was missing. It must be back in the truck. So one of the straps was missing off my knee pads. I only got one knee pad active right now, but either way, I'll just lean on the left if you will. <laughs> but, uh, I'm gonna, like I said, I want to do the same thing on this side. So I come out, one tie out from the corner. I do the same here. I'm going to take those two, pull them together as such. I'm going to make sure that I'm taut along that line. So I'll just feed my 10 pegs through the first, then through the second. Make sure I'm not hooked on anything. I'll set that nice and taut along that line and just peg it down. I'm going to take this corner, pull it nice and tight to the other two points and peg that down. Just as such. I'll grab my walking stick now. Just need one of them at this point. Now the thinking really is this center is going to end up pulling upwards by putting a walking stick on the inside of it. See I'm a little bit tight still. I'm going to come in a bit on the side to give it a bit more flexibility. So I'll just take this side, pull it back out shift in a bit, just give a bit more kind of leeway if you will, and set it back in. I'm still relatively taut on this line, and it's become a little more slack on this side, but that'll tighten up as we adjust. So the thinking really is going to be, I'm going to take this 
walking stick, I'm going to slide into the shelter and set this walking stick up in the middle. I put a rubber piece on the top of my walking sticks to help ensure that it doesn't puncture through the tarp. So I'm just going to go in and find a just exactly where the height of this will be so all the sides become tight and then I'll show you the next step. So now to get in and adjust that walking stick I'm just going to take one of the tie outs off where the two came together one in from the corner. I'm just going to pop those off so I can kind of open it up a bit and get in there. The thinking really is I know where the center tie out is in my tarp I want to be square to that and kind of line up to it if you will and then I'm just gonna adjust my walking stick so that it's as tall as can be now like I've shown in previous videos you can easily take this one tie out that's in one from the corner, put a small loop on it and have it where it was a little bit easier. Ooh, the wind's coming. <laughs> it was a little bit easier to hook this on and off. But rather than do that in this video, I'm going to show the open awning position because I've got more expansive plans with the shelter. So before I go showing the open awning configuration, I'll just stop and kind of show you this all closed down so as you can see it's an extremely simple shelter to turn around and set up i didn't necessarily have to use the walking pole as you can see there's a tie out that sits on the center at the top there i could have easily turned around and just used that with a ridge line and that type of thing but i wanted to show the walking stick being used because when i go to create the awning i'll use the other pole of the walking stick but as you can see it gives a nice enclosed shelter that's uh, good from wind and rain and that type of stuff it is kind of a elongated pyramid shape it's longer from the two points where we tied down here and here than it is wide you know because we pulled in those two tie out points from the corner there it makes it that the width of the shelter became diminished a little bit you know not a huge amount but a little now you could easily use this shelter like i say if you were concerned about oh well, the weather being really miserable you still have these additional tie out lines that sit along you could easily pull them out and peg them down and really make it you know and do the same on all the different sides there's lots of tie out points that you could brace down if you wanted to you know that they exist pretty well the same on every side but to me that's a little bit overkill i'm in breezy conditions right now and i still see that as overkill but you know if the wind were blowing at you know 100 kilometers 60 miles an hour that type of stuff you'd want to consider battening that down even further with those additional tent pegs i'll push in the ones that i have here a little further but like i say i do want to show the open awning configuration because that's how i plan on using this shelter i am going to use my 8x10 tarp in this video as well to kind of expand this shelter size and usable areas and that'll come up later on in the video but let me first show you the open awning okay so i just pulled out another hank of rope out of my bag it's about 15 20 foot give or take gonna want to take my a10 pick and i'll take uh my other walking stick so, I'll just set that there for a second. So the thinking really is, I've just loose set the door here. I've loose set it onto that peg so it's easy to open. Now, I was one tie out in from the corner hooked onto that tent peg. But if I come to the center point instead, I'll just drop that tent peg. And I'm just gonna take my hank of cordage So 
supposed to be quick release, but a knot must have got caught up into it somewhere. Not a big deal. So, just make sure that's, yeah, had a prosic on the line. Of course I did. I always do. So I'm just going to feed through that center tie out now. I'm just going to feed the loop of my guy line through that. And then I'm going to feed the tag of itself back through just to cinch it on to that tie-up point. That way I'm on to that tie-up point easy enough. And I'm going to take my walking stick now. I'll bring it out a little bit and make sure it's got nice height to it. I'm gonna hook around the walking stick. I'm just gonna use like a slippery hitch there. Try to hook onto there. And feed the rest of the line through itself. Just so I'm onto that stick solid, or the walking stick if you will. Just so I'm onto that good and solid. I'm gonna pull that out and where I had the prusik line sitting on this guy line. I'm just going to peg that prusik down to the ground. So I'll come out. I'll let this all go slack for a second. I know roughly I'm going to put my 10 peg out, say, roughly about here. So, like I say, I'll just let that go slack for a second. Set in my 10 peg. Make sure I'm getting into the earth. Pick that back up. I'll take the prusik I've got on this guy line, hook that onto the tent peg, and then just slide that prusik back up the guy line to apply tension, and it's locked nice and firm now. Now this one corner left here, where it was the actual corner of the tarp itself, because pre uh, previously we had come in one. Now I'm just going to take this corner, pull it out tight, and peg it to the earth. It now creates like an A-frame shelter that I have with an enclosed back end. So I'll just grab another tent peg and drive this final one in, and uh, I'll do a pan around of the shelter at this point. So then, like I say, I'm just going to take this last corner pull it out nice and tight. I could have just un undone this tent peg and shifted to here, but because of how breezy it is, I don't mind using the extra peg, you know? But I'm just gonna peg that down to kinda keep that locked in place. And I'm using one of my crappier tent pegs. I've got better ones in the bag, but I'll dig those out because I need them for the next part. But I'll do a pan around now and show you the full setup of this shelter. So now this is an absolute usable shelter at this point in time. I mean, you could have stopped in the earlier where it was all kind of enclosed. But having the open awning, like I say, it gives this kind of A-frame style shelter. But the nice part is, it's got one side enclosed. I did put an additional uh, tie-out I pegged down there. Just because I know the winds were shifting direction. And there was a bit of an air gap there. And I like to have everything sealed up pretty solid, but I'll kind of shift around now to this side. But as you can see, a nice taut shelter, ample amount of space inside. And if the weather did turn miserable, you can easily just remove this awning and switch it back up. You know, if I pull out my tent pegs and it gets worse than the it is, I will peg down the additional tie out points that are along here and along the other side but hopefully it doesn't get much worse than it is but there you have it let me see i'll give you a pan to the inside easily big enough to have two people shelter into you know and like i say off of a single 10 by 10 tarp and using just the uh, walking sticks it allows it that you're not reliant on trees or anything around you as long as you got a clear patch of earth and you got your walking sticks with you this shelter is easily achievable 
but I'll move on to the next part the expansion of this shelter to give another area to kind of be in and work in okay I'll stop and make comment because I know if people notice they'll make comment <laughs> I just shifted my temp eggs on the side a little bit I moved the yellow one that was in here I moved it out to the corner because I trust those yellow pegs a little more and I put my little aluminum sp uh, spike into the center instead and that's really just to kind of help keep it to the ground to make sure the wind doesn't blow but primarily this yellow one is going to be carrying the load and then I shifted my spike that I was using to keep the awning open I just shifted it so that it was more center aligned it was off I could say it was over a couple inches so you know I know there's people with keen eyes that'll notice those things but so you know there is little fine-tuned tweaks that you do here and there to adjust your shelter and get it exactly how you want it if I wanted to use a pile of tent pegs I could tent peg down every tie out and make sure it was just rock solid I don't think I need to do that for this situation but either way like I say I'll start to move on to the next part of the video so there was so there was one small detail I forgot to mention that uh, where you had this fold sitting in here if the winds really pick up right through where you're at this will start to flap and become a little annoying so in order to kind of alleviate that you can pull this corner tie out out and you can peg it to the earth either this way or you can set it the other way and peg it to the earth this way and what that allows really is if the winds blow this won't be flapping inside the shelter and keep you awake for half the night so I'm just gonna take a stick instead of a tent peg and just peg that down and that'll just ensure that the flapping is to a minimal if you will you know if you had it all battened down you could do the same with the other side where the two tie outs that were in from the corner were pulled together if you didn't open it up into the awning and you had it all enclosed you could do this exact same thing over on that side and peg it down and that way you know as long as it's lead to the wind uh, in this situation the winds tend to be coming from more towards where the entrance of the shelter is so the winds will be blowing across here so this is the way I'll set this up to just help alleviate any wind flaps and I'll just leave it as such so I'm just gonna want to get out my large hank of rope now and I want to set up a guy line that kind of comes across over top of the shelter and I want that guy line to be about six and a half seven foot off the ground so I'll pull this out and I will set up the guy line but I just remembered as you can see when I went to grab my rope I forgot my ground pad so I'm gonna have to hike back out to the vehicle grab my ground pad I'm gonna grab some wood when I'm out there too and bring that all back and then I'll cut back to putting up the ridge line sorry guys I just I know I'm gonna lose a bit of sun hours now but either way I, I need my ground pad so I don't want to have to be cutting down boughs I'm in a, a balsam fir forest area in the location I'm in so there really isn't a lot of good boughs to be setting down as bedding one way or the other I need my ground mat all right guys so i'm back from the truck i did throw in the ground mat already i just stopped for a minute to catch my breath but uh as you can see that ground mat is six foot in length and two foot wide it's easily big enough to fit into the shelter without issue uh, you could easily have a second person sleeping next to you potentially if you really needed to cram them in you could get three in there but that'd be tight you know but uh given that i also went back and grab some wood this is my wood harness I haven't shown this in detail in a video in a while now so maybe I'll stop and kind of add this in as a little extra to this video of exactly how these wood harnesses work and how they're made I'll show you how these wood harnesses work it allows it where you can carry a bundle of wood holding it with a single stick now potentially set it on your shoulder and that kind of stuff take the weight off your arms but allows you to move with it when you're out in the bush so when it comes to this setup it's really quite simple if you've watched previous videos of mine you'll see that I use a lot of 
six to eight foot lengths of cordage where they've got a loop tied into one end. So I'll just set this down for a second and gonna open it up. So the thinking really is I'm using two of those six to eight foot lengths of cordage and with the loops that are on the end I'll just kind of show you here all I did was take the loop that I have in the cordage fold it back onto itself and pull it through and just form a, a second little loop if you will and what that allows is I can take a stick now feed that onto the stick and just cinch onto that stick really simply so this stick is a little bit smaller than the handle stick and then what you do is you just take and I do the exact same thing on the other end and you take the one stick and you kind of feed it through the other and by doing so it kind of allows you to lock all that wood in place you know you make sure you just kind of cinch it that the smaller piece of wood is nice and against the bundle and off you go you can now carry multiple small pieces of wood off of a single you know firm branch if you will but it allows you to kind of throw it over your shoulder and carry it with ease so this is just kind of a quick and easy way to bundle up wood and carry it with you using if you use the kind of supplies like I have using these six to eight foot lengths of rope that I normally would have in my bag I've normally carry a couple dozen of them they sit in my bag they're there all the time those and loops I tend to use quite a bit you know I think with one of these I even had a prusik loop already tied on to that guy line if you will because I use them for guy lines you'll see them in all my videos I use them for a ton of different stuff and this one was exactly the same it's a prusik loop sitting on that guy line and as long as your two different lengths of cordage that you're using end up having an overall same length you're golden you know but and that's exactly what this is here I've got my guy line it's got a prusik loop sitting onto it I just slid the prusik loop right to the end when it came to tying on to this larger branch rather than do just the loop kind of fed into itself I did like I've shown in previous videos where I take that prusik loop I fold it onto itself and then I reach inside and grab the two inside pieces of cordage and just form a secondary loop that way it allows me to slide onto the wood easily enough and then just cinch down onto it with a lark's head knot so you can see really elementary there's not much to doing this it's not a complex procedure but it definitely makes carrying piles of wood when you're out in the wilderness way easier you know how far it hangs down on your body really depends on how long the length of cordage is and how big those bundles are you know but these are two pieces of 550 paracord you know this is easily going to be able to carry more than your body weight in wood you're probably not going to be carrying that much trudging through uneven terrain in the wilderness so these are ideal for kind of handling and processing wood okay so enough of the side gel though back to the main video here so I've got my main guy line it's got a large loop on the end so I can easily feed my hank of cordage through it when I wrap around the tree I'm just going to go to this tree on the other side of the shelter hook around that and then come back and hook onto the tree behind the camera here and then just set up a, a ridge line And these balsam firs are really handy given that they have so many sticks and little branches that come off them it makes it easy to kind of get your loops and stuff up with little hassle because these little knobs and branches just won't hold everything as you're going so like i say i'll just feed the main hank through it allows it that i'm strapped onto this tree now and i'll start running my ridge line up. Start running my ridge line back over to the other tree. I'm going to do the same here. 
and a hook on all those little nubs. makes it easier to keep it up nice and high as I'm coming around. So now I've got this prusik loop that I've got sitting on my line. I'm going to use that like a trucker's hitch. So I'm just going to take the tag end of my ridge line. I'm going to feed that right through that prusik and start to apply tension. It allows me to get an extremely tight ridge line. I'm just going to put a little half hitch in here to start with. Just kind of set that. Make sure it's not going to slip. Find myself a stick and something half decent. Rainforest wood, flake on Now this one's a bit firmer and I'm just going to feed that stick through the loop on the half hitch just to ensure it doesn't slip out. It's just as easy as that. I've got my guy line up. It's nice and taut. And now I've got a drip line where if any moisture was coming off the tree it would hit this knob normally and I want to run down this line a little bit away from my camp. Okay, well, it's my turn to stop and take a break for a minute. You know, and it's time for you guys to do a bit of work. If you enjoy this type of content, like, share, and subscribe, will you? I gotta switch out the GoPro batteries and that kind of stuff. Wanted to stop, get a bit of water into me, take five or ten minutes. I still got lots I want to put in the video, so, you know, stay tuned, but like, share, and subscribe. So I pulled out my slightly smaller, I think it's an 8x10, uh, Rab Sil Tarp 2, for people that like to know the names of things. It's about the same denier as uh, the 10x10, so it's super lightweight. This is uh, somewhere around a pound, pound and a half. I don't even think it's a pound and a half, probably closer to a pound. But, uh, I'll just throw the bag for it in my dry bag with other gear I have. I like to keep everything organized when I'm at my camp. So this tarp, like I say, it's more of a 8x10 tarp. So slightly smaller than this one, not much. I'm going to take the tie out that sits on the corner of the lengthwise of it. And just grab another small stick from the area. See, the breeze is picking up a bit, so it's definitely on the breezy side of life. But I'm going to take this prusik I've got sitting on my line. I'm going to uh, feed the corner of the tarp through the prusik. And then I'm just going to put a little lark's head knot in there, like I showed earlier in the video, the same as I did with the wood, you know, the, the harness for the wood. And I'm just gonna set that piece of wood on and that way I can lock in this tarp onto this prusik. And I wanna adjust the prusik so it's sitting well over, probably a foot or two over top of the entrance of the shelter. So I'll just pull out another tent peg. I had another one in my bag, another stack of them. I tend to burn through them pretty quickly. So I moved that prusik loop almost to the center point over top of the shelter. And I want to take the kitty corner, or the opposite corner of this tarp. I want to bring it out. I'll just put my tent peg into it. I want to bring it out 
kind of line it up to the center of the shelter pretty well. And I want to peg that down. And I want to make sure that's good and tight and really well set into the earth. We'll take two more tent pegs now. I'm really just doing like a floating plow point shelter as the face of this shelter. So I'll grab one of the other corners now. I'll pull that out so that it's taut to the top and to the back. Put a tent peg into that. Set that in place. And I'll do the same on the opposite side. Make sure I'm over top of my pole. my walking stick if you will. I'm just going to pull out this side, put a tent peg into it, and drive it into the earth as well. Making sure everything's nice and tight. And there you have it. Kind of helps cut the wind profile from the front, and given the way that the main shelter body is set up and now gives me a large area that I can work in stay out of the wet weather I have small entrances I can get into on the sides but one way or the other it gives me a big area that I can put my bag into if the rains start coming heavy from what I understand potentially they could be later on in the day or tomorrow so I just want to make sure that I've got a large area that's uh, protected from the wet weather if you will so I'll do a pan around now with this so it's not the prettiest looking thing in the world, but functionally speaking, oh, sorry, functionally speaking, it's really fantastic. Now, it's a combination now of kind of a plow point shelter set over top of a closed A-frame, you know? You've got a small entrance here that you can get into. And like I say, I'll just kind of pan around. If, and now there's a large area inside. The camera's not really giving it huge justice but I've got quite a significant area there that's dry that I can tuck out into. Now I'll come around to the other side of this side is a little bit more open because this is an 8x10 shelter. This side is a little bit more open and really the main side I'd be coming in and out of. I still got to sit in that tent peg so that it's not going to be a trip hazard going in and out of here. But as you can see It really helps stop the wind from coming in the entrance of the shelter now. And this whole setup, you know, you could have people sleeping inside here. Or you could have additional bodies that are sheltered into that zone. Or just have it as a large area that was dry that you could store your gear in and that kind of thing. But as you can see... For I think the combined setup, minus the 10 pegs and the rope, is two and a half pounds. You know, it's really, really lightweight and uh, very flexible. There's one other thing I'm going to do to kind of give a bit more headroom in there of this tarp has a center tie-out point. Now I'm going to take, I had this drip line that was coming off where I connected it earlier in the video. I'm going to take this drip line and use it to kind of pull out that center tie out point and just give me a bit more headroom in there. So like I say, I'm going to take that drip line I had, I'm just going to feed that through the eye or the tie out and apply a bit of tension to that. And then I'm just going to put a little half hitch in here. Nothing really complex. I'm not worried this isn't a structural one. This is more just to help give headroom. So. I'll put a little, like I say, a little half hitch, kind of just dress the knot. And then I'll find a small stick again. I'll set that to the loop of the half hitch and just pull that a bit. 
just to make sure that half hitch is secure and isn't going anywhere. And now that'll just give me a bit of additional headroom when I'm inside the shelter. I'll do uh, some camera work from the inside and show you how big this really is. So, I say I'm laid out on the ground pad. I, uh, I don't know how the camera's picking this up. It's never good to have GoPros inside of shelters. I never find it gives it justice, but you can see there's a really large amount of space in here. And having that plow point on the front now makes it that if the wind changes direction from almost any direction that the wind's gonna come from, really, that uh, the wind has been cut off and is no longer part of your worry when you're inside the shelter, you know, within reason. There's a small, tiny little opening over here that's just big enough to get in and out of. And this side, because the plow point kind of comes over top of the A-frame shelter, it makes it that it's a wind guard and a rain guard either way. But, as you can see, you know, I have full arms fully ex extended, and I'm leaps and bounds away from the other end. Of I could spread gear out and have my wood and have my... Uh, backpack and all sorts of good stuff in this area and still have plenty of room of this this would be easily big enough to have four people and it's made out of a single 10 by 10 and a single 8 by 10 tarp you know so when it comes to lightweight stuff if you're traveling with somebody else this more ideally this uh, plow point shelter would be more ideal if it was a 10 by 10 because you know it makes a nice square and everything lines up a little better but you can definitely, as you can see, you can definitely do it with an 8x10 and still achieve the same kind of result. But uh, no, I'm quite pleased with the uh, weight to the amount of space ratio that exists there. You know, for two and a half pounds to get this level of shelter is really quite good. So and to uh, try to give some justice to the amount of space that you get inside this plow point shelter, I pulled off the wood then my backpack and just toss them in you can see they take up very little space that's a I believe a 40 liter bag that I've got all sorts of you know molly webbing strapped on for extras and that stack of wood and it's really just taking up a small portion of underneath this plow point shelter area you know I've got lots of room in here I really wish the GoPros would give it more justice to the amount of space that it makes available. So, you know, if you don't want to have it that you've got tarps right up in the air, you can do a more, in you know, a low key setup like this where everything's closer to the ground. And like I say, off of two tarps, you can create a significant sized area where you're out of the elements. So I've gone ahead and pulled my wooden backpack back out from under there. I just wanted to show you an example of the size of things. But my water supply is starting to get a little low and I'm going to get a bunch of water into me so there's a creek just over around the bend here so I'm just going to uh, get as much water as I can into me and then go fill this up and get it ready for the boil later on. So now is a camping life hack if you will. I've got a loop of cordage. Now on my belt, I really, when I'm traveling around, I try to keep my hands free as much as possible. So I just turn around and on one of my belt loops or on the belt itself. I feed the loop of cordage through, just kind of set it on itself so I'm strapped on there. And then I do that same knot that we showed earlier where I just want to reach in, grab the two center cordage pieces, set a piece of wood on there as a toggle. I now have that toggle strapped to my hip where I can hook in my water bottle and just have it that my water bottle is now being carried on my hip and keeps my hands free. When I'm moving around in the forest, I'm in bear country. Now, this is one of the most densely populated areas for bears. So I normally have bear spray. I haven't made comment about that. No. I don't make comment about that too much in the past but I have bear mace <coughs> that I normally carry with me I don't tend to carry a firearm <coughs> sorry must have got a little bit of bear mace on me <laughs> but needless to say 
So I want to keep my hands free so I can easily get access to my bear mace if needed. And if I've got the GoPro in one hand and the water bottle in the other, that kind of stuff, it kind of fills up your hands, if you will. So I do little hacks like this to just kind of keep it that my limbs are free if I need to use them to grab protection. And as you can see, I can easily just take that toggle off, get my water bottle free. And just slip it back on again. So, and it may look warm and cozy here, <laughs> but we're at the warmest part of the day. I don't know if the camera's picking that up okay, but we're at zero degrees Celsius, so 32 Fahrenheit, and it's warmed up to that. It was probably about minus three or minus four Celsius earlier. So even though it looks like it's, you know, nice warm conditions where I'm at, it's not. <laughs> so for the next phase of the video, just grab this stump because I'll use it as a table. For the next phase of this video, I, uh, I'll start to get my fire stuff together. I'm just going to do a tripod in this video. It is really my tried and true method that I like to use. Of the main thing I really wanted to show in this video was this A-frame shelter with the closed back end and how you could set it up without having to rely on guy lines or trees or anything. It really is a flexible shelter. You can configure it in multiple different types of configurations. You know, the example I showed here, uh, you know, you can definitely play around with a bit. You can bring up one of these corners and open it up if the weather's fair, that type of thing. You know, I put the plow point shelter over front of it because I know that there's going to be a lot of wind that's happening over the next 48 hours in the location I'm in and potentially there's a call for a significant amount of rain as well. So I just wanted to make sure that I've got an area that's dry and secure and that kind of stuff, yeah? But, uh, I've got to go off and find myself some sticks. Really, I need to straighten that out a bit. That'll be good enough. Just something to set my stuff on, right? <laughs> you always want those creature comforts and to get up off the earth. You know, I don't think I put it in this video, but normally I have this little stool that collapses down. You know, legs all fold in and that kind of stuff and it sits on my backpack. I just pulled it out of I I always like to have this as one of my creature comforts with me. You know, it's uh, a couple added ounces, but to me it's invaluable to feel comfortable when you're out in these environments. You know, you want to have it that uh, your energy levels up, your comfort levels good. You know, you feel like you're living in a lot of the creature comforts you're accustomed to. If you come out into these wilderness situations and you're just kind of living in suffrage that's not something you really want to do to yourself and will make it less enjoyable. So, you know, you'd be amazed at how much a little stool like this will just kind of add to the comforts. I think I hear a logging truck off in the background. Oh, whatever. But either way, there's some uh, straight stout sticks that are about six to eight foot in length. I need three of them. They're off in the location that's over closer to the water. So I'll go harvest some of those now. So this is a prime example of one of the types of sticks I'm looking for. You know, typically I try not to harvest live branches as much as possible. You know, I did in the last video, but it's something I'm normally reluctant to do. You know, if I, if I can avoid having to kill any type of plant life or wildlife or anything else, I really do try to do, you know, as minimal impact on the environment as possible. But uh, I found this stick and it was a good one. I snapped it to length that I needed. I didn't bother putting that on video because, you know, why show you a snap and a stick, right? But I'm going to use that as my measurement rough for this. So I know roughly where that's going to sit now. I'll just uh, take out my Gomboy. It's a Gomboy 300 Silky. I don't think they make these anymore, but I do like them, so... And just as simple as that really. So I need three of them. I do try to use dead woods 
like you say, as much as I possibly can. And in this environment, quite often, I can get away with doing that without having to rely on any type of, you know, living trees or any of that business. These are in prime shape, a little bit bigger than my thumb when it comes to the end diameter. You know, I'll end up having the cordage come in a little bit for the tripod, but uh, it makes it amply, you know, amply good enough to uh, carry the weight of the water to boil over the fire and that kind of thing. So like I said, I've got two of these now. I've got to find a third. I'll be looking for the same kind of thing, something that's fallen. You know, if it's not dead, it's right on the edge of being dead, but still has a lot of good bone to it. You know, I don't want something that's really fragile and easy to break. It's got to be able to carry weight. So like I say, I've got to grab one more of those. Okay, so I've got my three sticks now. Like I say, they're not absolutely perfectly straight, but when you're in the forest, flat and straight aren't things that you come across that often. So needless to say, these are about as straight as they get. So I've got another one of my 28 inch um, loops of cordage that I've just tied together with a fisherman's knot. I used to do 24 inch ones and what I found was when I doubled them up on, e on each other or on themselves and form kind of a, a doubled loop that when I wanted to go around these larger diameter pieces of wood for making my tripods the 24 inch was always just a little bit tight so I switched up to 28 inches as I've gone through time you know just to make sure that I would easily be able to do exactly what I'm doing right now so like I say I've got these three pieces of wood that are sitting kind of side by each with each other I'm just gonna take the middle one once I've put that doubled up cordage loop onto them about five or six inches in I'm gonna take that middle one and just rotate it and I'm gonna keep doing that oh. I'm gonna keep doing that until that cordage this looped cordage just really bites on itself fairly tightly and with 28 inches I normally can get away with doing it once maybe twice and then it just starts to become too tight and then I just can't go any further you know I was even debating on whether I'm gonna go up to 30 inches the next time I kind of do off my batch of loops if you will because normally when the loops start to wear as time goes on I'll turn around and make off say 24 or 30 of them or something and I'll just have them all as a fresh kit in my bag so like I say, at one point in time they were 24 inches, then they became 28. They might move up to 30, but we'll see. 28 seems to be good in that regard. Of I'm able to do almost everything I'd want to do with the 28 inch loops. So if people are wondering why I kind of picked that arbitrary number to make the length of my loops, it really was just evolution through time and working with nature. So as you can see though, the tripod is set up now. I'll have my fire roughly in this location so I've got to clear that out a bit and kind of get that ready to go but uh, this tripod is really sturdy it should be able to carry the weight no problem when it comes to the sticks themselves you don't have to clean them off to be super perfectly clean in fact I like having little nubs like this one right here where I can turn around and if I want to have something be warm by being near the fire but not necessarily on it those nubs come in handy so you don't have to clean them off and make sure everything's perfectly done you know the imperfections in life sometimes are the good ones right but uh so i'll just kind of shift this out of the way at this point in time but that's roughly where the fire's going and start to clear out my fire pit and that kind of stuff and then i'll get on with the fire yeah so i had a small delay on my end you guys aren't going to see it in the video really but i was over looking for deadfall twigs that i could use as the uh kindling to get the fire going and uh just as i was talking about earlier with the widow makers and stuff and being mindful one of the uh branches came down off of a tree when the winds picked up and clipped me on the side of the head so you know it wasn't major it was no showstopper or anything but uh either way it was bleeding for about 15 20 minutes i just had to make sure that the the bleeding stopped and you know take care of that first uh, i was debating on whether i'd have to pull out the first aid kit but it seems to be solid now so needless to say i'll keep moving on with the video but it's exactly as i was talking about when you're out in these dense forest areas where there's a lot of trees that are close to each other you know especially these balsam firs that have you know a lot of these small branches on them 
and they're handy for when you're putting up ridge lines and that kind of stuff but when they're 40 50 feet up in the air and one tree rubs against the other with the wind you know that stuff easily starts coming down on you you know the area i'm in i pick for a reason this area a lot of the trees the higher up branches that are larger have already been knocked off you know and uh and i've camped here on multiple occasions in the past so i know it's safe you know even when the winds pick up there's not a lot that comes down but over in the other area i was in the location that i was looking for the dead falls and that kind of stuff you know these things happen you have to be very mindful when you're out in the woods so I've cleared off the area I've had fires right in this same location before I know I'm pretty close to the trees here this area is compact it is what it is but uh, I like I say I have had fires right in this specific area in the past so I know that it's safe to do so but what I'm gonna do is just dig a little tiny trench right in the middle of my fire pit. I'll just kind of clear out that dirt now. And then I'm going to lay my wood. This is dry wood that I found in the surrounding area. I'm going to lay my wood bed that I'm going to start the fire on right on top of this. And the reason for putting that little trench in there was just to allow a little airflow to happen in underneath. It just helps get the fire going a little easier. This moss is bone dry. I was lucky this piece of wood that I harvested was sitting in an area where no moisture was really getting to it. So it's really dry and gives me kind of a safe thing to set my tinder bundle and that type of thing on top of so I can get my fire going, yeah? I just harvested off two more pieces of dry dead wood that were in the area and I'm gonna take those and form just a V shape in fact I'm just switching the other way I'm gonna take those and form a V shape and the main reason why I'm doing that I'm just gonna shift the order of things there the main reason why I'm doing this is that when I put my tinder bundle down and it starts to burn when I go to put you know the branches and twigs and stuff on top of it I'll rest them against these pieces of wood and it gives it just a little bit of rise or a little bit of airspace that's in between the tinder bundle burning and the twigs that you want to have catch. So as you can see with these surrounding trees, there's a lot of these kind of dead nubs. So if they don't have much bone to them, they're easy to harvest. I'm just going to grab a small pile of these to use as my kind of smaller wood, if you will. So I've gone into the local area and gathered up some small twigs and small branches. This is a little wood rasp I have. I normally carry this in my bag. This thing can be handy. I'm just gonna take one of the smaller pieces of wood that I have. Oh, I'm sorry. And I just wanna run my wood rasp across that and let it do what a wood rasp does right and the thinking really is because the area I'm in is balsam first and it's not cedar or any of that business it's far more difficult to get fine shavings so having something like a little wood rasp allows me to create these kind of fine shavings so i'm going to harvest this and oh nick myself there i'm going to harvest off a pile of these from some of this wood just so i have something to help get the fire going to begin with so i made about a baseball sized um, pile of shavings with the wood rasp and now i'm going to take a couple pieces of fat wood that i have and i'm just going to shave those down Nice and fine. You can even use the back of your knife if you get a nice 90 degree spine to kind of shred that fat wood and give it a whole bunch of surface area. I'll show you what that looks like up close in a second. So you can see, hopefully the camera's picking that up all right. By using the back of your knife, you kind of create these really fine shavings of the fat wood. They'll take a ferro rod spark really easily. So I'm just kind of cut that piece off and do the same. And I'll make a bunch of these. They're almost like 
little matches, if you will, where a bunch of fluff that's come off with the 90 degree spine and just a little stick of the fatwood. I'll make a little pile of those and I'll add those to the shavings bundle that I'm going to throw the fair rod spark into. It's a little breezy, so I gotta be careful now. I don't get this all blown away. But I'm gonna process probably just a single stick. I don't even need to use the second. But I'll do that and add it to that um, wood rasped pile, if you will. So now I'm just gonna baton a little bit of wood here to make sure that I've got some smaller pieces for early on in the fire. I'll finish off this piece and then we'll get the fire going. Okay, so the one last thing I'm going to do before I get the fire going is I've got that piece of cordage. It's actually off of the logging, you know, the wood harness that I had earlier. I'm just going to take that and it's got a loop in it. I'm just going to hook that onto one of the three legs of the tripod. And then I'm going to just wrap that around a few times. Nothing complex. Now the other end, it had a loop on there as well. And just like I did with the wood harness, I've got a piece of wood. And this wood is slightly smaller than the width of my water bottle. So I'm just going to take this piece of wood. Or sorry, take this piece of cordage. I'm going to feed it through itself on this end to form that loop just the same as we talked about earlier. I'm going to set on that toggle and that way the toggle's in place on that piece of cordage. And now I'm just going to take my water bottle. I'll do this as an example. I'll pop it off and put it back on once the fire is going but I'm going to just take that toggle, put it down inside my water bottle and let it hook onto the lip of it and it'll hang as such. When I want to adjust that water bottle in height I simply can just loosen off how many times it's wrapped around at the top and I can drop it down to be right over the fire or I can bring it back up you know a couple inches at a time and just set it to exactly where I want it to be so it's a flexible way to kind of set your bottle over top of the fire I can also adjust the legs of the tripod if I bring them out wider the whole setup will come lower if I bring them in closer the setup will lift so it gives me the left, right, and up and down, all that kind of stuff, forward and backward control with the tripod with ease. So like I say, I'll just pop this water off for right this second, because I just don't need it on there quite right now. I might even have to make that toggle a little smaller, just to make it easier to get it out, but it gives you the idea of what has to be done here. So I'll just wrap it up to keep it up and out of the way of the heat while I get the fire going. All right, well. Time to get the fire going. So I just used my hat because it is really windy out here just to cover over the little pile that I was talking about earlier. The combination of the, the wood rasp shavings and the fat wood where I made the shavings with the 90 degree spine of the knife. Now, like I say, these fine twigs where I put that V, the V of the wood, it allows me now to set those fine twigs over top of the heat very early on without worrying about smothering the fire. It allows them to dry out and, you know, hopefully take flame.
because I didn't have a lot of small twigs here. I'm going to have to be a little more eager when it comes to putting on this bigger stuff. I want this stuff to dry out and hopefully catch flame as soon as possible. It's a little drier than it was last video. Last video I came out, it was immediately after a bunch of raids, so... I'll just let that sit and hopefully it'll just build up. The breeze actually works to my advantage right at this point in time because I don't have to get out my bellows and blow into the fire or anything. The wind is doing the work for me, if you will. Now it's just really, because this wood was primarily harvested off the land, it's will it dry out and take flame fast enough before I move up into the wood that I brought from the truck, which was already dried. So I know it looks like I'm putting on a lot of wood early on, and I am. A lot of it's really just my concern about the how much moisture is in the wood in the area and how fast can I get the wood that I know will burn, like I say, the stuff in the truck, how fast I can get that to take flame. Well, it was super windy all day long. As soon as you get the fire going, right? The wind's calm right now. <laughs> Classic. I know it's not a very strong fire right now. Uh, hopefully, like I said, hopefully all this wood just starts drying out. It looks like it's starting to now. Just starting to get the first whiffs of the wood from the vehicle. It's starting to take a bit of flame. That's a good sign. No, but I didn't want to count on that as being my primary. I really want to try to work off of the wood that's on the land as much as possible. And that way, if you're ever in a real emergency situation where you're having to rely on that stuff, you have experience to do it. So when I'm blowing here, my bellows are in the bag, and people have probably seen those in previous videos, but take your fingers and you pinch them together with your thumb and form a little diamond shape in there. And when you blow, you blow through that, and it allows you to direct the wind into the base of the flame and control the way you're blowing way better. So I'm just really going to leave this alone at this point in time and let the heat just do what it does. So you can see now the fire's going really well. That breeze that's been, you know, causing me grief all day is now feeding to my advantage. The unfortunate reality is the wind has changed direction a little bit and some of the embers are blowing close to my tarp. I'm still 10, 15 feet away. I don't know if the camera gives it justice, but I am 10, 15 feet away with the tarp and stuff. So hopefully those embers cool off before they put pinhole burns in my tarps. But you know, such is the nature of life, right? But either way, I'll let this kind of, you know, strengthen up a bit more. It looks like it's doing good now. I'll move into the larger fuel wood and then I'll get my water on the boil. So I've kind of settled the fire, fire now. And uh, just gonna, Get ready to lower my bottle into it. So I'll just reset that toggle back into the uh, water container and then lower it down. I could even come up one. Now for fine control. That's where I use the tripod legs. It allows me to really pinpoint exactly where I want that container sitting over top of the fire. But I'm just gonna bring this off to a boil, cook off my noodles and get some food into me. Be another couple scenes, but thanks for watching guys. So like I say, I just adjust my tripod legs 
I can lower that water bottle almost exactly where I want it to be. And that's one of the reasons why using the tripod is my tried and true method when it comes to hanging stuff over the fire. I can put my grill on with a similar kind of thing or you can rough it and just hang a water bottle like I'm doing. So hey there fellow YouTubers, it's Frank Bush here again. Thanks for tuning in to another one of my bushcraft adventures. As you can see, I decided to go with the classic tripod when it came to uh, uh, cooking over the fire this time. I really wanted to show the um, A-frame style shelter with the closed end where you could set it up with just uh, some walking sticks. You know, that can be really uh, handy if you're in areas like open fields and that kind of stuff where all you have is a couple walking sticks, you know. Adding on this uh, plow point shelter was really just an add-on for myself because I know the winds were, you know, you guys saw earlier in the video, the winds were breezy throughout the video really. And if uh, any type of rain comes, I just want to make sure I've got a fairly large area that's dry and out of the wind so I can be comfortable. But if you enjoy this type of content, please like, share, and subscribe. And thanks for watching. Cheers.